Without any further ado, I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Alberto Saleo, who will be then introducing all of the opportunities that uh, we have uh, prepared for you. I believe ISNAF has played two important roles. One is really to celebrate Italian professors and technologists and researchers that have been successful in the U.S. with their awards. And the other role that it's playing more and more now is to connect Italian universities to American universities through its internationalization activities and exchange programs that are just getting kicked off this year with the Politecnico di Torino and the University of Pisa. So I'm very excited about the future of these activities and I think there is a lot of potential to bring Italian students here and then make sure they go back having broadened their network, learn something new and, and hopefully bring it back with them. For today's ISNA story, we are live from Stanford in Palo Alto with Professor Saleo. Alberto Saleo is a full professor of material science and engineering and department chair at Stanford University. Here we're in the middle of the what we call the science and engineering quad. This was built uh, starting in 2006 to have a number of engineering and science departments all together and mimic the old quad with sort of a science and engineering centric location for all students to congregate and collaborate with also some uh, public campus art to make the environment also a little bit more pleasant. I grew up a little bit all over the place. Uh, my father was in the diplomatic corps. Um, so I was born in Prague. Then we moved to Washington, D.C. From Washington, D.C. we went to Rome. Then from Rome, we moved to Germany for a few years. From Germany back to Rome. And then we went to Paris and that's where I finished high school. And I came back to uh, Rome to do my undergraduate degree in chemistry at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. After five years of studying chemistry uh, at the University of Rome, I won a fellowship to spend one year in the U.S. And I came to UC Berkeley, ended up staying for my whole PhD there. Currently, I'm professor of material science and engineering at Stanford University. and I'm also department chair of our department since uh, 2019. I joined Stanford in December 2005 as an assistant professor, and then I rose to the ranks uh, from then until 2019, where I was promoted to full professor. So these are some of the shared facilities. In this case, this is a photo electron spectroscopy. It's to measure composition of uh, surfaces of materials. Uh, there's two instruments. Uh, these are used by students. Uh, they get trained on, on, the, on the instruments. And even though they're really expensive instruments, they're completely used by students as part of their PhD. In my research, we work on organic semiconductors. So these are materials that are like plastics that rather than being used for your typical use of plastics, which would be packaging or bottles, is used to make electronic devices, which could be transistors or solar cells or LEDs or biosensors uh, in the form of thin films. And so in my group, we deposit the materials, we characterize their structure, figure out how well they work and make demonstration devices to prove their functionality and try to optimize them. On these, we uh, deposit very thin layers of our materials and then are analyzed by X-ray diffraction at the synchrotron here at Slack. And this allows us to determine the structure of the polymers. Some examples of applications of organic semiconductors include um, solar cells that can be deposited on flexible substrates that would be ultralight and could be almost painted on top of a roof. One of the advantages of these solar cells is that they have what is called a very low energy payback time. It doesn't take much energy to make them, so the energy they produce pays back the energy that was uh, used to make them quite quickly more quickly than conventional technologies, in addition to other advantages like being lightweight 
and uh, rollable, so easier for installation. Um, other applications would uh, involve uh, biosensors for wearable devices. For example, if you want to sense your electrolytes in sweat, uh, you might be able to make sensors with these type of materials that in real time would be able to tell if you have any pathology that's related to biomolecules that would be present in your sweat. Uh, one of the biomolecules we looked at is uh, cortisol, which is considered a hormone that you release when you're stressed out. And so in the end, what we were hoping to be able to do is to have sort of a measurement of how stressed out you are from your sweat, which requires continuous measurement because cortisol varies during the day and so just a point measurement is not enough. The type of technology we developed for cortisol can be used for other hormones. We're actually now developing for melatonin. As long as it's a small molecule, it, one should be able to build a sensor with the same technology to sense it. And so this could usher the era where you measure a certain number of hormones, but also metabolites, a bunch of different uh, biomolecules doesn't have to be in sweat. Sweat is a little tricky. I don't think doctors really trust what happens in sweat. So maybe you want to do saliva or you want to do interstitial fluid. That's the general idea is sensing as many molecules related to your physiology as possible to figure out if there's anything off in, uh, in your head. And here we do our electrochemical measurements. Uh, the sensors I talked about before are measured on this table. Uh, we have uh, electronic probes, um, electrochemical uh, measurement setups. Uh, it's all pretty standard stuff. And uh, I would say pretty messy too. <laughs> What excites me most about my research at this point is really the impact that we can have. So on one hand, I really like the fundamental science that we're doing. We shoot electrons and x-rays at these materials using very advanced techniques to figure out where the atoms are and how that uh, affects their properties. But in the end, being part of a family of materials that can enable technologies um, that can be really life-changing for other people, whether it's clean energy with batteries and fuel cells, or sensors for precision medicine is really an exciting space to be in. Mm -hmm. Actually, this was an interesting project where we made a, a, a chip uh, that had electronic devices that behaved like synapses, so they could have their conductance being tuned in a very controlled fashion. And eventually they were interfaced with neuron-like cells that emitted a neurotransmitter that then was used to tune this device. So it was a connection between biology and electronics, sort of a biohybrid device where biology was used to change the properties of an electronic device. So actually this was a collaboration with a group in Italy at Italian Institute of Technology at the time in Naples. And the application, sort of the long-term application would be for example, prosthesis, where you would want the nerve ending to communicate with an electronic device that then would control the prosthesis. It would be sort of the very, very long-term application. The award that I love the most is the Gores Award for T Excellence in Teaching, which is our university-wide um, teaching award. It's given to uh, one faculty per rank every year out of about 2,000 eligible faculty. So what I really like about that award is that it, it rewards teaching and it means that a lot of people felt compelled to write a letter saying that my teaching was really exceptional. And this was in particular for the class that I teach on thermodynamics. What I think made me eligible for this award is the fact that I really pared down the discipline to something very, very simple. What I do in that class is all you need to know is just a little bit of calculus, a little bit of very basic physics, and then everything is built up from scratch with essentially only very few assumptions. Uh, it's laborious, but um, thermodynamics is a sort of very mysterious discipline for a lot of students, and showing it really built from the ground up uh, removes a lot of the mystery and, and really promotes rigorous thinking. 
And I think students recognize that they've all studied thermodynamics, they've all been confused by thermodynamics and seeing it started from scratch all the way built up to how you use it in material science makes them understand that it, it's really not black magic. A lot of it is quite simple once you really start from scratch. So these are time capsules, just as a little... Um, Meaning? So in 2017, the class of 2017 buries a box with important objects of oh, 2016. Sorry. I see. And then in the same ceremony, they opened the one that was put in 100 years earlier. Oh. So every graduating year has a time capsule. Here. Oh, I see. So they, they store objects that they have significant for that year for that or for year, that class? Yeah, for that particular year and class. I don't I know see. what goes in there, but ah. uh, there's a committee that decides what I in. see. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Thank you, Alberto, for having us here for the interview and see you at the next ISNAP event. Absolutely. Well, thank you for visiting. Venite a trovarci. Thank you.